I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenter for today, Carol. Carol is a Marion County Master Gardener. She's passionate, volunteer, a Mason Bee enthusiast, and an advocate for sustainable gardening practices. Her journey is marked by a, a deep connection with nature and a dedication to service and an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. See, she asks that you can join her as she continues to cultivate a greener, more vibrant world for all of us to enjoy. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you to uh, Marion Conservation um, District for inviting me here. Uh, I love mason bees and I love sharing all I know about mason bees. So again, thank you for all joining us today. And um, we will be learning about how to help our mason bees uh, thrive here in the mid Willamette Valley. I am Carol Sofkowski. I am a master gardener as well as a master melatologist. Um, both programs are about uh, gardening and melatology is about uh, learning about native bees. And uh, uh, right now that is uh, learning about native bees in Oregon. Both of those programs are part of the Oregon State University Extension Service. Um, the OSU um, Extension Service uh, creates uh, citizen scientists, which is what I am, uh, where I go out and learn all I can. And right now I'm learning all I can about gardening and bees, which are these two programs that I just described. However, if you are interested in something else, um, go ahead and check out the Extension Services in your area. If you're in Oregon, it'd be Oregon State. If you're in a different state, there are other states that have Extension Services. And I do say, um, if you're passionate about something because there is a master composter, there's a master food preservers. So if you are interested in something, go find out if there's a program for you. The Marion County Master Gardener Association um, basically has two homes. We have our Master Gardener Demonstration Garden, which is on Center Street behind the Health and Human Services Department in Salem, Oregon. Uh, so you can see the, uh, this is the Health and Human Services Department. This is that brand new building they just built. And way in the back here is 1.7 acres of garden area that the Master Gardeners uh, maintain and keep up. If you do come and visit, come and visit on a Monday uh, between nine and noon. That's when all of us master gardeners are out there working on our plots. You can come and ask us questions. We all love to talk, especially about gardening. And if you are able to come visit us at the garden, please feel free to come stop by our help desk. That's on um, the corner of Center, or sorry, excuse me, Capitol and Gaines Street um, in the middle of Salem, downtown Salem. Uh, you can bring in uh, bugs, you can bring in a little branch with your questions, and we will research it and find out the answer of whatever your question is and get back to you with that. And we are there from Monday through Friday from nine to one, um, pretty much every day throughout the whole year, except for holidays. Okay, so for today, we do have some learning objectives. We're going to learn about the value of pollinators. We're going to learn about mason bee care, overview of their life cycle and different pests and diseases that we can talk about today, as well as the next steps. Uh, I don't know about you all, but for me, I've gone to different presentations and different classes and then left and go, well, what do I do now? So hopefully after this presentation, you guys will have a list of all sorts of things you can do, a, a whole bunch of homework, which we want, right? <laughs> Oregon loves pollinators. That's why I love Oregon too. It's one of the reasons you all are here to learn about our pollinators. We also have a brand new license plate. I don't know if you guys have seen them. They were released, I think last November. I've seen plenty around the gardening and different uh, pollinator things that I do, which is what is really cool is our very own Merrick Stanton, who is a high school student, um, who is also the youngest master melatologist in the state of Oregon designed this license plate. Not only that, but $35 of the $40 you pay to DMV goes back to the Oregon State Extension Services um, to reinvest into our um, programs. There's also the Lynn Benton B event, which is actually tomorrow. If you are interested, go ahead and register tonight because tonight's the last day to register. That is where they talk about different pollinators throughout Oregon. There is also a Mason Bee Talk in the um, program for tomorrow. I will also be there helping um, sell the bee supplies too. And uh, our Marion County Master Gardener Association is doing another pollinator symposium this fall. 
Um, so keep your eye out for that as well. All of these Zoom presentations, you can always learn more and more about different pollinators through that and many more. Pollination, that's what we're here to talk about today. And this is obviously a mason bee and we'll talk about why and how we can identify that this one is a mason bee. But first we're gonna talk about different pollinators. And unfortunately, we're gonna talk about a little bit bad things first. We have insufficient pollinators now and how that connects to our, our food and ultimately can affect uh, to death. And Harvard Gazette did a study back in 2020 and they found that the world has produced three to 5% less food from our pollinators, which three to 5% really sounds like nothing. However, what that translates to is an estimated 427,000 lives lost each year from insufficient healthy food. So what that means is our pollinators are not uh, producing enough healthy food for us. So things that can combat that, uh, combat diseases such as heart disease, stroke and diabetes, we're not able to combat it because we don't have the healthy food to consume. And that's pretty huge just by itself. Uh, US EPA is also looking at the different pollinator concerns, mostly about the pesticides, the pesticide risk. And all of these over here are different pollinators, which we don't really think about when we talk about pollinators. A lot of times when someone talks about pollinators, we think of birds and bees and butterflies. Well, we don't really think about the lizards or the bats or the beetles, but those are also pollinators we need to continue to support as well. We also need to promote the pollinator diversity. There's the Princeton research that shows the decline in pollinators ripples across the ecosystems. Insects pollinators can't easily be, easily be replaced. And they did a study where um, humans went with paintbrushes and Q-tips and tried to um, pollinate every flower. And systematically they did. Um, they went and ev touched every flower. Insects don't really do that. Insects fly flower to flower, flower, flower. Somehow, even though we touched every flower, the insects, even jumping flowers, pollinate more than what we can do. So really we need to not only um, promote our pollinators, but we need to promote the pollinator diversity. And while we are talking about mason bees today, there are 75 different mason bees in Oregon alone, and that's according to our Oregon Bee Atlas. So our pollinators, what do they do? Well, they move genetics, they eat pollen as food, they have some pollen byproducts such as honey, and they provide food for all of us. And there are more than 600 bees in our Oregon Bee Atlas. Now, who are our pollinators? We should know most of these, right? We know our butterflies, we know our moths, definitely know about our bees. And then the wasps, which I like to point out the wasp because a lot of times people don't uh, know about the wasp, but really, um, in the fall when our other pollinators start to go, go to sleep for the winter and start to hibernate or die, um, the wasps come out and keep pollinating for a while. As much as I hate to say it, our flies actually do um, have great pollination. And of course our mason bees and very specifically to our area in the Willamette Valley is the blue orchard mason bee. That is the one that is native to our area. Now, why do we like mason bees? Huge reason, they're super pollinators. So first I'm gonna show you a honeybee. This is a honeybee. And if you see, you can see that kind of yellow spot on the back of their thigh, that is their pollen sac. When a honeybee goes to uh, pollinate or goes to collect their pollen and nectar, they're very clean. They go and they, they pick it up and then they spit on it and then they attach it to their thigh. That's that pollen basket there. Now, mason bees, they're almost like kids. They like to belly flop flower to flower. And this is what they look like. So they get pollen all over the place. Sometimes they'll even roll in the flowers and they'll just love all the pollen. So they belly flop flower to flower to flower. When they do that with this technique, they are pollinating 95% of the flowers that they visit, which that's almost like a, a one touch versus a honeybee 
where they need to go multiple times because they're so clean. So there's not a lot of pollen that comes off of them when they visit the next flower. Now each mason bee um, lays around 24 eggs and they have a pollen ball on that egg and it takes a female approximately 800 flowers to visit to make that pollen ball. Now 800 uh, flowers times 24 eggs, we're talking about 19,000 flowers that they're visiting. 95% of that is we're talking about 18,000 flowers that are now pollinated from these mason bees. And um, another way to look at this is you have one cherry tree or one apple tree. It will take over 500 honeybees to pollinate that entire tree. It will take approximately seven mason bees to do that same work. Now our mason bees, they are solitary, so each female is a queen that will lay her own eggs, but they don't mind living with their sisters. That's why you can put all the tubes in the same spot. So they're not aggressive, they share the space, but each tube is, is their own queen. And uh, this picture right here is actually one of the mason bees that emerged this year, unfortunately. It emerged a couple of weeks ago when we had that nice, wonderful, wonderful warm weather. Uh, went ahead and put her out on the flower here. And then today and yesterday, it's been snowing. So hopefully she's still alive. She found a warm spot. And then also these blue orchard mason bees look like a fly, but they're not a fly. So be careful when you see flies, especially early spring, because it might be a mason bee there. And we're gonna now go over the um, life cycle of the mason bees. And um, I'd like to tell you a story about how I got started. And uh, really what happened, I knew nothing about mason bees. I knew nothing about bees altogether. Uh, my husband and I were at a fair of some sort. I don't remember if it was, um, if it was a farmer's market or if it was the, um, uh, you know, county fair, but there was a vendor there that was selling mason bee houses and you got 10 cocoons if you purchased a house. So I went ahead and purchased the house and got my 10 cocoons, went ahead and, and put them out, did what I thought was right. And, and when I went out to go and visit my house, I could see all the bees flying around. And then there was a little face in, in the house in one of the tubes. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, it's a bee, it's, it's lovely, let's keep them there. Well, I later found out that that was a spider. Well, in a spider, they like to eat the bees and they like to eat the bee cocoons. So unfortunately, my very first year of trying to do mason bees, they all died. So that was not fun for me. Um, later, I just kind of gave up, to be completely honest. I gave up on it. I'm like, I killed them all, this isn't for me. So I put, put the houses away, put them in the barn, forgot about them. My husband and I were then moving. So we're packing everything up, look in the barn and all of a sudden half the tubes are filled. So I'm thinking to myself, if I do nothing, these bees are, are going great. If I try too hard, they die. So I started going to these kind of classes and presentations to really learn about how I can keep them alive and make sure that that never happens again. So I'm very happy to see how many people are attending this class, or this presentation, and hopefully many more people will watch this online. And again, our mason bees are a solitary bee. So one queen will go ahead and lay her eggs in here. These mason bees are native to the Americas. And what I mean by that also is there's no honey because honeybees are actually European honeybees that have been brought here. So honeybees are not actually native to our areas at all versus um, these native bees. They very rarely sting, they're non-aggressive. If there's enough food around, everybody gets along. However, if you do get an aggressive bee in there, most likely make the mason bee will either not survive or will try and find somewhere else to go. Now these uh, mason bees are early spring bees. Uh, usually, you know, in years past, we would be probably putting these bees out now, but again, it was snowing this morning, so we're not gonna be putting them out for at least a couple more weeks. Now these early spring bees, uh, the females live six to eight weeks. The males only live about two weeks, um, but ultimately they live about six to eight weeks. So that does mean that every, every year that's a new generation of bees. 
these bees are so much fun to watch. Once you, once you have them, you'll know what I mean. They're just fun to watch uh, flying around and then flying into the, the flowers with their pollen. <clears throat> and now the, this part here, in nature, mason bees have a 30% survival rate. And with our human intervention, we can increase this to 90%. I've actually been told to remove this because it is no longer true. I, however, kept it because I wanna to explain to everybody why it's no longer true. Um, so this has been kind of the norm for the last 10 years or so where um, ultimately us going in in the fall, harvesting the cocoons and cleaning the cocoons, we could increase their survival rate exponentially. However, what we've noticed is, um, especially in Portland area and Lynn County area, is that the Houdini fly is moving in. And they found over 10% of their tubes being taken over by this Houdini fly. So we can no longer make this claim. And that is very sad to say. Um, we can do another, uh, some kind of experiment to see where we're at now, but that will take time and then that research. However, with us saying this for the last 10 years, I think it's very important to say why we can't say this anymore. And that is because we are getting new and more pests moving into our Mason bee houses. And now the life cycle of the Mason bee. So this is for the Willamette Valley. This will probably um, be altered a little bit depending on where you are, but if I think most of us are in the Willamette Valley, so this should be about the same. However, again, with our crazy weather we've been having with our springs the last several years, these dates are still a little, um, can be off a little bit. So first off, we have our male bee is the smaller bee on top here. The female bee is the larger one. And the male bee comes out first, like I said, lives for two weeks, really has a one track mind. His only goal is to mate with the female and impregnate her. And then they do that in mid-March to April because right about now we would be releasing them. So the males would emerge first. After that, our female here stays uh, working. She works the whole time. First, she collects her mud and she makes her mud wall. And then after that, she visits her 800 flowers to build her pollen ball. And then she lays her eggs and then gets another mud wall and repeats mud wall, pollen, egg, mud wall, pollen, egg. After that, the egg does hatch into her little larva and the larva then eats the pollen ball, which then the larva spins its cocoon. And you can see the, the larva on the left in the middle is the metamorphosis and on the right is the live adult bee still in the cocoon. Those cocoons just continue to develop from June until October. In October, we have our human intervention and then again, the next March, the next bees emerge. So like we said before, this is a whole new generation every year. What do mason bees need? <clears throat> well, they need hollow tube-like structures. What we have pictured here are uh, natural reeds, but they can also use wind chimes. They can use the side of your house. They can use um, cardboard tubes with liners in them. They'll use racks. They'll use all sorts of things. They need mud. They're mason bees, so they do need mud walls. So they need access to some kind of mud. You can buy mud, and I did buy a mud mix um, just to see what it was. But we live in Oregon. Dig a hole. Literally, dig a hole, have it near your house, and those mason bees can use that mud there. And then of course, all its bees are living, all living things need water. Make sure you have um, some kind of ramp or some kind of structure for your, for your bees. Cause if you just use a bee, a bird bath, um, bees and insects will drown. Right, excuse me. Uh, right now I have a ramekin outside with marbles in it and I fill the ramekin with water. Bees can land on the little marbles and drink, drink what they need and fly off. And you also need blooming flowers within 300 feet of your house. I know honeybees can fly for miles and still come back to their hive. These mason bees, about 300 feet. They do not fly very far. They need their food and their sustenance right near them. I get asked this a lot about whether to use tubes or racks. 
So the tubes that you can use are natural reeds, TESOL, which um, if you're driving on, uh, just driving anywhere in Oregon, basically, you'll see on the side of the road, these long sticks with almost like a dried small pineapple on top, that's TESOL. And if you um, go out and harvest one of those, you'll see that it's almost uh, naturally six inches segments that they have there and you can break them apart and you can use those as tubes. And those are some of the natural resources that without our structures, that is what mason bees would use. Racks are reusable. You can use them multiple times. You can open them up. And especially if you use liners with them, uh, you can keep them cleaner. You still do need to clean them every year. And the holes that you need are six inches long and five sixteenths in diameter. And so we say that's what you should use. Um, that is what the mason bees choose to use most of the time. There's been lots of studies and tests of different size, uh, different lengths of tubes, as well as different size and di diameter. What they found is majority of the bees will use six inches long and five six sixteenths in diameter. However, you can see, and this is one of my houses, um, from before, and you can see there's much smaller tubes and much bigger tubes, and both of them have mud in them, so the bees will use whatever fits them, and some are bigger and some are smaller. And the six inches, uh, so when the male mates with the female, the female can choose which, uh, which egg to lay. So in the back of the a tube, she will lay her females, and in the front of the tube, she'll lay the males. So if it's too short, you'll only have males being laid there. If it's too long, they end up using about six inches anyways. The, the female will just uh, crawl in about six inches. And the tubes, whatever you use, they should be removable and openable because we want to be able to harvest them and clean them. Because again, those pests are coming in and they're coming in hot. <laughs> but ultimately the choice is your preference. Both of these pictures are my own houses. So I do use both still. I still use natural reeds, I use racks and I use cardboard tubes with liners. So I have no preference really. Sometimes the tubes, when you open them, you know, trying to open them can get uh, hard on your fingers and hands, but so can the racks. So ultimately uh, try them all out and figure out which ones you like yourself. Now mason bee homes, so the actual structure around your tubes, there needs to be an overhang. So you can see in all three of these pictures that there's a, a quarter inch to about a half an inch room from where the end of the tube is to where the end of the house is. And that's so any kind of rain or wind, your tubes are still protected from that. Your home should have a cocoon hatchery. A cocoon hatchery is also known as an emergence tube area. So all of these, if you notice, have some kind of little attic space, that little triangle on top. The picture on the very right, you can see that little dowel knob. You can pull that out and that's where the cocoons would go. And otherwise the little holes on the other houses, you can put a little emergence tube in there, which is just like a PVC tube with a hole drilled in there. Cause you'll see the hole drilled on the one on the right. What happens is the, the um, bees will emerge from their cocoons and see that tiny little light coming out of the hole and they'll know that's the way out into the world. And again, you want to make sure your homes are within 300 feet of your early spring blooming flowers uh, because they won't fly that far. So you want to make sure that they have access to their food close. You also want to make sure that you keep paper or some kind of other things in the holes of your house because otherwise you'll have other things move in, such as spiders, and they will kill your bees. Not only spiders, but there's also a lot of earwigs really like these houses. It's a nice, warm, dry area for them, and we only want our bees. We don't want anything else in there. There's also... Um, Woodpeckers really like these tasty little cocoons. So this here in the middle is a bird guard, which is just a uh, chicken wire or hardware cloth. Um, really, most people have something, some kind of fence-like structure um, already around. And if you just cut a little section off, you can just reuse that for your little bird guard. 
you also want to make sure these homes are um, three to six feet high because you really want them to be in eye level. If they're too short, you'll get a splash back from rain. Maybe you get a, a dog or something coming up and sniffing on them and you don't want them too high because you really want to be able to see them because again, these bees are so much fun to watch. You also want to face, have these um, houses face the morning sun. So south to southeast. Uh, you don't want them to get too hot either, so you want to make sure they might have some shade in the afternoon. <clears throat> These houses here are not recommended, and we'll talk about why, uh, but about 20 years ago or so, when we first started talking about uh, raising our own mason bees, uh, everybody just uh, took a block of wood and just drilled holes in it, drilled that 5 16th hole in there. And it worked for a long time until we finally realized we can't open them. We can't open them to clean them. So even if you have one of these drilled hole boxes now, uh, so long as it's new and you drill some holes in there, these will last three to five years and you'll still have good healthy mason bees come out of them. However, eventually these will get overran by mites and mites are not something that we want and not something that we want to, to keep around at all. Now this one next to it is very nice, it's very pretty, but it's only four inches deep. So if you use these for mason bees, you're only going to get males. However, what this looks like to me is more of an insect hotel. So if you do put something like this out, I wouldn't really expect mason bees to use it. They might, but I would expect other insects to be utilizing that kind of house. This next one, this uh, teardrop one, is a very beautiful one. It's one you can still currently buy at Costco. We don't like it for several reasons. First one, it's bamboo. Bamboo cannot be opened. Trust me, I tried. It cannot be opened. <laughs> if you do somehow get them open, you are at risk of damaging the cocoons inside. You also notice that the tubes are right at the same um, length as the structure, so there is no overhang. So any kind of wind or rain will go right into your tubes there. And the way that this one is designed is it can swing. And when it swings, it can displace eggs. And we don't wanna do that. We want that egg to stay on the pollen ball. And this last one here, those are plastic straws. And as much as we love to recycle, we don't want to recycle these for our mason bees because plastic encourages mold and we there's no way to have that moisture escape. So we'll just keep that water right on those cocoons, which is not good for them. Our mason bees here prefer our native flowers. So of the native flowers, um, they have their pollen and their nectar that they need and pollen is protein and fat and nectar is our carbohydrates. So our native flowers have a good amount of both of those for our native bees. And some of that is our Mahonia Oregon grape, our big leaf maple, our willows, service berry, cherry trees, apple trees, the beautiful lupin, also the beautiful camas, and tick seed and coreopsis. And these are some of the many um, early native flowers that we have. Personally, I do know that mason bees will use hyacinth, Asian pear trees, and plum trees, very specifically because these are in my yard and I see them using them. Now, when my husband and I were living up in the Dows, we were actually in a rental house and we were not allowed to dig. So we had potted tulips and potted hyacinths, which in all reality are not good for the bees because tulips have very little nectar and hyacinths have very little pollen. My theory is that they were they were compensating by going back and forth between them, which might be true. I have no evidence of that. However, I do also know when we were at the Dells and when we had these flowers, these flowers have a pretty short time that they bloom. So there was a panic moment where I went to my husband freaking out saying, my bees have no more food. So we had to, we had to go and buy more flowers for my bees. And we do this every year. Now cocoons, you want to start your, your, your mason bee, where do you get them? You really want to find a local source. And a local source for here, us here in the Mid-Willamette Valley is Lynn County. Lynn County, um, the extension services sell local cocoons. Um, 
They have uh, Rich Little, who is a retired entomologist. Uh, he taught me most of what I know about the mason bees here. And uh, they harvest they harvest multiple areas um, of Lynn County as well as Marion County. They come up here and help me with my classes. And we can combine those cocoons and then they sell them. And that is what they're doing tomorrow. You want, need to know, once you have your cocoons, you need to know when to put them out. And there's a couple questions you need to ask yourself. You have your native blooms. And how is the weather? Because again, uh, like I said, I've already had a couple of my bees emerge. However, again, we had snow today. So hopefully those ones survived, but I put the rest into my fridge and I'm gonna be releasing them as the days get warmer. Ideally, you would have 60 cocoons and you'd want to put out a third of them at a time. And 10 to 14 days apart, so long as you have the good weather, leaving them 10 to 14 days, they all should emerge. All of your mason bees will emerge. And usually you want your cocoons out by late April. And I say usually because two years ago when we were so cold for so long and then we finally got a little bit warmer, we were still putting out our cocoons at, till the end of May. And again, that's based on the weather that we have. Within two to five days of putting your cocoons out, your bees will start emerging. So again, having the 10 to 14 days apart, you will know whether those are mason bees or not. Now, what do you do with those cocoons that, uh, that are already opened and or did not hatch? Well, you need to do some sanitation with them. You wanna wipe down your emergence tubes. You wanna clean them out before you put your next cocoons in there. Any unhatched cocoons you wanna bag up and throw away or you make a parasitic wasp detector. And a parasitic wasp detector is just a clear container that's airtight um, that you put in there. And the parasitic wasps, while they are good for certain things, they are not good for mason bees. Uh, so last year I did do my own parasitic wasp detector and I was successful. And here it is. So all of these little guys that are moving around are parasitic wasps. And while that looks like a whole bunch, it is, uh, about 10 to 15 of these emerge from one cocoon. Whereas one mason bee would emerge from one cocoon, we have several of these that will emerge from that same cocoon. So again, we don't wanna be spreading these parasitic wasps around, especially not for our, not for our mason bees. They are good for other situations. My friend told me that she uh, had horses and she would get, uh, she would get uh, parasitic wasps for the manure piles. So that's good for manure, not good for mason bees. What was really nice, actually really side note, uh, when I did the parasitic wasp detector last year, um, I saw the wasp come out and then I got the email from Bee Notes, which we'll talk about a little bit later to have you guys enroll in that. I got the email from Bee Notes saying, parasitic wasps are out, bring in your, bring in your tubes, uh, which is what we're going to talk about right now is once those parasitic wasps are out, you need to bring in your racks and tubes because otherwise that new generation of parasitic wasps are now going to lay their eggs into your new cocoons. Uh, some kind of mesh bag or paper bag is where you'd put your tubes and or racks into and you just um, shut them up so that nothing else can get into there. You wanna store these into a warm, dry place, such as your garage, and make sure these tubes are upright. You wanna make sure that egg stays on that pollen ball. And again, um, so what I did was I put mine on a rack. Um, I have some dogs and cats. I didn't want them to knock them over. Not only that, but the earwigs, they do like to, they like to go around all of the uh, mason bees, tubes, and racks. I have not seen any earwigs eat them, um, but I have seen them just overtake the house. And then after that, you store in your stuff, uh, you're storing your racks. You don't need to touch them until October or November when we finally go and harvest our cocoons. And what, what you see on the right is what we'd like to see. And that's a, a tube filled with wonderful, beautiful cocoons. 
um, some of the pictures in the middle on the on the left is some of the things that we've been finding uh, lately. So last year, um, we found a lot of adult bees that were in the tubes. And that again was because it was so cold, the adult bees will retreat into their tubes to and wait for it to warm up. It's just, they never warmed up again to so that they can fly it, which is sad, but it is the reality of where we are with our weather. <laughs> The three most common pests of mason bees are mites, chalk brood, and parasitic wasps. Now the parasitic wasp we are able to identify during their life cycle of when they're flying around and, and pulling the wrecks in. The mites and the chalk brood, we won't actually be able to identify until we harvest the cocoons and we can actually open them up, open up the tubes, open up the wrecks and see that they're there. So this one to the right of those words, those are the exoskeletons of mites. So those are all the dead mites. If you can see um, right on top of where those dead mites are, you can see some white around. That's the live mites. So they can still squeeze through um, the racks and get to the next tube. And if you also notice the, the exoskeletons, um, that fills that entire cell. And if that cell is from one of the males, so one of the ones at the front of the tube, every single bee that uh, chews through their cocoon and is trying to chew through um, and go through their tube will walk through those mites and that's how they spread. So if we don't clean our, our houses and we don't clean our tubes or um, cocoons, those mites will actually spread even worse. And then down below, this is a mummified larva, which is chalk brood. So what happens when that egg hatches and that larva starts eating the pollen ball, there is this chalk brood fungus in the pollen ball. And how big that larva is basically shows at what point that larva ate that fungus. So you'll find tiny little larva that's mummified, or you'll find one like this that looks like it's just about ready to spin its cocoon, but ate that fungus and it mummified it up. Now, when we harvest, if we accidentally puncture this or um, somehow squeeze it, the fungus spores will go everywhere. So it is something very carefully when we have to work with when we clean. Now, again, these are the three most common pests of the mason bees. And there are many other pests that can come and affect the mason bees. And that's this list right here. So anything from birds to cuckoo bees to um, blister beetles to cats and dogs even. I don't know about your cats, but my cats like to uh, attack flies that are flying around. So I bet you anything they'd be attacking mason bees if they're flying around too. Another huge problem in the Pacific Northwest because where we are and with all the rain we have is mold. And that's mold in our racks and mold in our tubes. And again, this is why we have that overhang. So hopefully that the rain will actually touch our racks or tubes. Um, the rack one here, that one probably would have some survival there, but this tube, that is so badly molded that if there was a cocoon in there, most likely that cocoon would have just as much mold and that would be hard to try and save. Now, when we harvest, we wanna clean our cocoons and our tools, because again, if we don't clean our tools, we could be spreading chalk brood and or mites everywhere. What we wanna do is we wanna use a bleach wash. That bleach wash is gonna be two ounces of bleach per gallon of water. And you wanna add one drop of dish soap, such as Dawn, and you wanna rinse that, um, agitate that around for about two minutes. And then if you notice that picture there, there's a little colander inside that bowl. So once you agitate those cocoons around, you lift up the colander and you rinse that with cold water twice. These cocoons are made of silk, so they will not drown. Once you've done your cold water rinse, you're gonna take them out, put them in one, uh, one layer and air dry them for an hour. And then you're gonna store it in a humidity chamber in the fridge until spring. Now there's two different chambers that you see in the bottom there. The one on the left is one that I purchased and that is called a humidity chamber. So those are um, in one layer on top of foam. And that foam is on top of a cloth piece, which is what I spritz with water to keep them 
keep them moist, but not wet. And then you close the lid and there's air holes in the lid. And if you notice the Ziploc container next to it, there's air holes in there as well. And there's a smaller container with a wet paper, uh, not even wet, a damp paper towel. So you'd squeeze it out, make sure no water's coming out, put that in there. And then um, again, with the air holes, and both of these would go into the fridge, usually your um, vegetable crisper, and make sure that everybody in the household knows that those are bees and not food. And then with this, because this is in your fridge, uh, it can have mold that grows onto it because there is water in there too. If that does happen, just go ahead and do another bleach wash to get rid of that mold. And we use the bleach because that kills the chalk root fungus. They will not kill the mites though. So that dish soap such as Dawn will break that surface tension and then the mites drown. All right, now for our next steps. So what do you do now? There's many things you do, but first and foremost, again, because it's still snowing, we're gonna hold, we're gonna hold off on preparing our garden still because there's still many other things that are using those leaves, those branches, um, all those piles of, of things that we want to get rid of to make our garden look pretty, but don't touch them yet because there's things living there. So we wanna just hang tight just a little bit longer with those. We also want to be sure and know where our bees are because uh, you know we're in Oregon so the forest is here. We all live just right next to our forests. So uh, not only are these bees in the tree stumps of the forest or the trees of the forest, they're in our trees, they're in our tree stumps, they're in our bare ground. So we wanna make sure that we can, we can keep uh, all of our pollinators very happy. Not only that, but very specifically for our mason bees, you wanna start looking around your yard. You wanna see where your morning sun comes from. You wanna see where your blooming flowers are. Now, both of these pictures are of my house, uh, backyard area. The one on the right, uh, that house actually came from crown bees and has the bir uh, bird guard on there. And you can see in the background, that is my Asian pear tree that is blooming. Um, so it, it is facing the east. So you can see that's all good there. It is also po um, put up on a four by four post and a little brick on the bottom. So if I don't like this place um, this year, I can easily with the hand truck, take this and move it somewhere else. And the one, uh, the picture on the bottom left, that is a house from Lynn County, uh, Lynn County uh, Master Gardeners. And that is my almond tree that's blooming behind it. This one here is a little bit low. Um, I think I am going to move that uh, to see if I can have a little bit higher up next year or this year coming up. Other next steps, you want to find out what other people are doing in your area and you can do that through iNaturalist. You want to harvest the cocoons if you have them and I know that seems weird to say right now because we should be releasing them However, if you have cocoons and you have tubes and racks and you haven't harvested them yet, we do still want to clean them because again, we don't wanna be spreading the mites and uh, chalk brood around. We wanna make sure we take care of that before we put out our new cocoons. You wanna plan and plant for next year. Always plan and plant for next year. You wanna acquire your houses and other supplies. Um, if you don't know where, um, you can look online. There's many other places that you can um, purchase from. You want to contact your local extension services and find out more information. Uh, Marion County, uh, we are available, like I said, Monday through Friday, nine to one. And you want to wait, wait a little bit longer, wait for at least this last cold snap to go. Hopefully this is our last cold snap. And then there is an Oregon Bee Project strategic plan, which is a very good plan to follow which is coming up next. That plan is to protect our bees, increase the habitat, slow that pressure, slow the pressure of, of the um, uh, exotic bees and the different diseases and pests that are coming in. We wanna expand our knowledge of all of our bees and we wanna make this sustainable. And how do we do all of this? Well, you can become a bee advocate. 
and you can subscribe to Pollination. Both of these are through the Oregon State University Extension Service. And then, of course, here it is, subscribing to Lynn County B Notes. Um, if there is one thing that you really get from this, I would suggest to subscribe to the B Notes and to go to the Lynn County um, Master Gardeners webpage where it says Pollinator Projects. There's different um, resource materials for the Blue Orchard Mason Bee, which is specific to our area. And again, you can um, you can register for Beevent. I don't know if you can see, but the second tab on their LCMGA website says Beevent. Uh, you can register for that. And again, that is tomorrow. And then conclusion, hopefully you'll learn the value of our pollinators. You got some good information on our Mason Bee Care. And you got some next steps on what you need to do. Uh, these are the references that I uh, utilized to create this presentation. And then after this, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I've always been, I've got all these questions now. What do I do? Where do I go? Here's where you can get more help. And that is my personal email. Feel free to email me. I love talking Mason Bees. Um, so email me at any time, sign up for those bee notes. Again, that is something very important. Uh, the Marion County Master Gardeners uh, Mason Bee classes are the ones that I do teach myself. There's one in the spring that's happening next week on March 9th. And then there's a fall cocoon har harvesting, which I'm actually doing the first Friday in October and I'll be harvesting cocoons on my desk um, for you guys to see. And now are there uh, any questions? Thank you, Carol. There are some questions in the chat. Uh, what would you do with all of that, the big tub of the wasps so that you don't just release them? You throw them away. Okay. Which is very terrible because I don't like killing anything. So I actually put them away where I forget about them. And then when I go back, they're already dead. So I don't feel so bad. Are we able to clean now any cocoons that were not cleaned earlier? Yes. And I highly recommend it. However, when you do, make sure you are outside when you do it. Uh, last year at my spring care class, we had somebody who did not harvest their cocoons, so we did them together. We were inside and the mason bees started emerging as we were cleaning out or harvesting the cocoons. So yes, do it please. Um, however, do it outside where it's still nice and cold so that they don't start emerging on you while you're handling them. And uh, how do you keep paper wasps out? And with that, that's where you just have wadded up paper or just filled with other sticks or things and just keep them, um, any holes in your house, just fill them up with whatever you have. And that should keep your paper wasps out because otherwise there's room for them to come in. Okay. Um, is there a lazier way to do this? Like, can you just buy all of the stuff? Yes. Cool. You can. Um, and so B-Vent, you can, there's, they have kits where with everything, um, you do still have to actually manually harvest the cocoons um, at Crown Bees. They have everything. And honestly, some of them are prettier. So instead of a paper bag, those mesh bags, that's, I did purchase those at Crown Bees. I did purchase that mud mix from Crown Bees. Um, but honestly, dig a hole for that one, but the mesh bags are a lot prettier. So I do like those, but that is me and my personal opinion. Do the males emerge sooner if you have cleaned them and put all in the same container? What I have seen is yes. Uh, when I go out um, and kind of walk around my garden and you can see, so the female mason bees really look like the flies. Um, the male mason bees, you'll see the, like their head and they'll have a little mustache that are white versus the female that's all black. So they really look like a fly. Uh, let's see. How do you deal with the wasps in a container without letting them escape and not harming the cocoons? So the parasitic wasp container. So when they're in that container, the bees have already emerged. Hmm. So the, you could see the open cocoons in there. If you're worried about putting them in the container and having more mason bees come out, that has happened to me twice where I had two little mason bees come out. I just released those because at that point it was just the mason bees coming out, not the wasps. Uh, let's see. Do you know of any place local near Tigard or Woodburn that would have this stuff? And maybe about uh, what the cost is like, how expensive is this? 
I do not know of any place local to Taggart or Woodburn, um, but you can order online. Um, how expensive is this? It really depends on, on what you want to purchase. If you want to just purchase the basic house, you're looking at probably about 40 to $50. If you want to get the nice pretty house with the decorative roof, with the decorative this, that, and the other, you're probably looking at $75 to $100. All right. Well, Carol, thank you again for joining us today and um, helping teach us about mason bees and other pollinators as well. Um, I believe that you have another presentation scheduled with us for the fall. Is that correct? Yes, that's the cocoon harvesting. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, we will see you again for that. And uh, thank you all for joining us today, too.